Let's take a moment to dive a little bit deeper into some of the capabilities that a VPN has and what those ingredients are to make those capabilities possible. Whenever we want to establish a VPN, it's typically because we're interested in the following. Confidentiality, and that's just the privacy of our data. Integrity, well, that's the, <laughs> the, the, the process of validating that our data hasn't been altered while it was in transit. See, in order to achieve confidentiality, we had to use extremely complex algorithms to be able to alter that data in such a way. We started off clear, we ran it through a cipher suite, and that cipher suite needs to set it up so that it's encrypted. This, this cipher text is not legible. It's, it's, there's no way to determine what the original data was if you don't have the key. It keeps it safe from anybody who might want to see what our, what our information is. And then we use very complex algorithms to turn it right back into uh, clear text data. Now this process of going from clear to cipher that cannot be beat to clear, like I said, is quite complicated. When you think about our packets, we could be jumping between different routers along the way. We could be going through cellular, through copper, through fiber, uh, through submarine cables that cross the Atlantic Ocean. Those could even be being tampered with. Um, how do we know that our data came out exactly as it went in? These are very sensitive uh, transactions. Maybe this is my payroll information. I need to make sure that all of my zeros and all my ones are exactly as they should be in someone's paycheck. So integrity gives us the ability to make sure that the data, when it comes out in the clear, is exactly as it went in. This is just as important as confidentiality is, unfortunately, not many people talk about it as often. Um, another piece that's just as important would be pure authentication. If we can bypass authentication, we, we would have unauthorized access into that network. So we can use things like a pre-shared key. We can use two-factor authentication. We can use digital certificates. We can actually use a mixture of these. Um, really, really neat. Non-repudiation is simply the ability to deny that uh, repudiation is denying that a transaction took place. So non-repudiation is taking away the ability to deny that a transaction took place. In other words, when you check out of the hotel, maybe they've got you on video camera, they've got your credit card, and they say, yes, this was really you. You can't deny that it was you at the Ritz-Carlton that week spending all that money on room service. They've, they've got you there on camera. They're, you cannot deny it. Uh, key management is a really interesting piece of this. You see, in order to take clear text, turn it into ciphertext, and then take it back from ciphertext into clear, we have to use an algorithm, like AES is very common, and then we need to use a key. So AES, when applied to your data with a special key, is going to create ciphertext. In order to take that ciphertext and put it back into the original data, we've got to use the same algorithm, which is why we agree to that in advance. We also need to use the same key. You don't have the same key on both sides, you're not going to be able to decrypt the data. So the trick is, how do we get the key to the other side? You'd say encrypt it, right? But we don't have encryption yet. So as we go on, we'll discuss how these keys are established and how these keys are changed or refreshed throughout the lifetime of the VPN to keep our data secure. In order to understand these concepts, we're going to have to have the basics of symmetric and asymmetric encryption. And I'll tell you for now, symmetric is just using the same key on both sides. Uh, Julius Caesar did this. This was around long before computers. Um, fairly straightforward. Uh, it just means whatever I use to encrypt the data is the same thing I'm going to use to decrypt the data. Um, this is fast. This is efficient. We still use it to this day, but it has one major fault. And that major fault is key distribution. And asymmetric algorithms are going to help us out with that. What asymmetric does is it says we're going to create a key pair. If you've ever used uh, RSA, or DSA to generate a public and private key. These two keys are used and we can encrypt with the private and decrypt with the public or encrypt with the public and decrypt with the private depending what our needs are. We'll actually go through this in a bit more detail and we'll talk about where this is appropriate. Uh, just realize that we have these two 
available to us, and the good news is you're not going to have to pick um, because we get to use both of them. We'll use asymmetric for key generation, and once those keys are generated, uh, we'll use symmetric because it's so much faster. Last but not least, we've got hashing functions, and these are what are responsible for providing us with integrity. So, as I mentioned in the last slide, let's just go through it one more time as a review. Symmetric algorithms use a single key to encrypt and decrypt traffic. The challenge is we've got to get that key to the other side. How are we going to do it? Uh, in the old days, they might have used Courier. Uh, they may have had, you know, a week in advance, they sent somebody with a decryption key. Once it got there securely, then they sent the message. But you can think about all the logistics and the overhead that this would potentially add. This has been a very, very old issue. It wasn't until the 1970s when we came up with this concept of asymmetric encryption, where they said, well, let's generate a key pair, a private key and a public key. Give your public key to the world. Anyone can have it. The private key, however, that has to be kept secret. And if it's ever compromised, the entire system is compromised. The neat thing is, everybody we give our public key to can support asymmetric cryptography with us. And if we get their public key, we can do it with them. And this is free. It doesn't cost any money. Um, it starts to cost money once we implement things like certificate authorities. And that makes asymmetric cryptography a bit easier for everybody. Um, we'll get into that as we, as we go on. Um, so looking at hash functions, again, this is just applying a complex algorithm to a data set and then coming up with a fixed length checksum. Uh, that fixed length checksum or fixed length value is known as a hash. And sometimes they call that a digest. And the only purpose there is just leveraging it to make sure that our data has not been altered. Now, alternatively, we can tie some authentication to this. And it's called HMAC, hashed message authentication code. But that means we're hashing and we're using some keying information. For now, just realize hashing function is taking a piece of data, creating a checksum. And then anytime we want to make sure that that data hasn't been altered, recreate the checksum and compare it. You'll probably do this anytime you download an ISO or bin image from Cisco. So here's just a quick example of symmetric encryption. Notice clear text data comes in. It's going to be encrypted. So we'll leverage AES and our key. Here's our uh, ciphertext in the middle. Once the other side receives it, because we've negotiated how we're going to encrypt before we started encrypting, that other side is expecting to decrypt with AES, and it has the same key. So assuming we've got the same key on both sides, we'll decrypt that data. Hello comes out the other side. Well, how did we get the key to the other side? That's tricky. So what we can actually do is leverage asymmetric encryption to get to symmetric encryption. I'll show you how this works. Let's say we've got Alice on the left and we've got Bob on the right. What Bob is going to do is provide his public key. B underscore pub. This is Bob's public key. And what Alice does is Alice says, I want to use AES because it's so fast. But in order to use AES, you have to have the key to decrypt. And because we don't trust the network, how do I tell you that without encrypting it first? You know, you, you can sense the conundrum. So what we can use is leverage asymmetric encryption. Bob builds that private public key pair. He distributes the public key to Alice. Alice takes what she wants to use as a symmetric key, encrypts it in Bob's public key. Now, the only person that can decrypt that is Bob because it requires Bob's private key. That's why they're asymmetric. Public can decrypt private, and private can decrypt public, but not the other way around. So in this case, if something's been encrypted with my public key, I decrypt it with my private. Now, I've got this symmetric key. Once that key has been transferred, we can drop into AES, and things go much, much faster. Hashing is just taking data, applying an algorithm to it, such as MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-512, and coming up with a digest. We can use that digest to verify that our data has not been tampered with. 